Microsoft warns that Chinese cyber espionage threat group Silk Typhoon has shifted its tactics, now targeting remote management tools and cloud services in supply chain attacks that give them access to downstream customers. The tech giant has confirmed breaches across multiple industries, including government, IT services, healthcare, defense, education, NGOs, and energy. Silk Typhoon exploit unpatched applications that allow them to elevate their access in targeted organizations and conduct further malicious activities. After successfully compromising a victim, Silk Typhoon uses the stolen keys and credentials to infiltrate customer networks where they can then abuse a variety of deployed applications, including Microsoft services and others to achieve their espionage objectives. Silk Typhoon storms IT supply chains. Silk Typhoon is a Chinese state-sponsored espionage group known for hacking the U.S. Office of Foreign Assets Control's office in early December 2024 and stealing data from the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States, CFIUS. All right, so who wasn't doing a job or was it an inside job? Because I always feel like stuff like that, they so tight-knit. How do you hack that? And these supposed to be the best of the best people that work at these jobs, allegedly. Microsoft reports that Silk Typhoon switched tactics around that period, abusing stolen API keys and compromised credentials for IT providers, identity management, privilege access management, and RMM solutions, which are then used to access downstream customer networks and data. Microsoft says the attackers can scan GitHub repositories and other public resources to locate leak authentication keys or credentials and then use them to breach environments. The threat actors are also known for using password spray attacks to gain access to valid credentials. Previously, the threat actors were primarily leveraging zero-day and end-day flaws in public-facing edge devices to gain initial access, plant web shells, and then move laterally via compromised VPNs and RDPs. Switching from organization-level breaches to MSP-level hacks allows the attackers to move within cloud environments, stealing Active Directory sync credentials, and abusing OAuth applications for a much stealthier attack. The threat actors no longer rely on malware and web shells with Silk Typhoon, now exploiting cloud apps to steal data and then clear logs, leaving only a minimal trace behind. That's what them people with Taylor Swift supposed to do. Bye. They left every trace behind. They supposed to make some type of email that ain't even connected to them, so send the money so there. Used her personal. Offshore account deactivate everything and go live with Russell Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> According to Microsoft's observations, Silk Typhoon continues to exploit vulnerabilities alongside its new tactics, sometimes at zero days for initial access. Most recently, the threat group was observed exploiting a critical Avanti Pulse Connect VPN privilege escalation flaw, CVE 2025-0282, as a zero day to breach corporate networks. Earlier in 2024, Silk Typhoon exploited CVE 2024-3400, a command injection vulnerability in Palo Alto Network's Global Protect, and CVE 2023-3519, remote code execution flaw in Citrix, Netscaler, ADC, and Netscaler Gateway. Microsoft says the threat actors have created a covert network consisted of compromised cyber roam appliances, Zixel routers, and QNAP devices, which are used to launch attacks and obfuscate malicious activities. Microsoft has listed updated indicators of compromise and detection rules that reflect Silk Typhoon's latest shift in tactics at the bottom of its report, and defenders are recommended to add the available information to their security tools to detect and block any attacks timely. And this is why it's important to have a good threat intel team because they will keep you abreast of all this knowledge because that's their job. I also think that it's important for, because it's a lot of credential-based attacks. So you need to make sure that you're following guidance for protecting your identities. Like a lot of companies, like the NIST guidance is that you're using a solution to monitor for passwords that have been leaked. So if you're not, then yeah, how how do you know? Yeah. You have to, it, it, that's, that is it's not a given right you're not going to know if you're not hooked up or paying for a service that's the thing. or you you know using something to give you this list because if you don't have 
you know, folks on your team who can do that and go pull, you know, top 500 bad, bad passwords or whatever the case may be, then how are you protecting yourself from credential based attacks outside of we use an MFA? Yeah, that and people are leaving keys and stuff in the, in the GitHubs uh, and they're finding them. Lock the keys up in the vault. Put the keys in the vault. And they just don't have stuff even configured correctly. That too. So uh, it, is, it is easy to be fair to misconfigure stuff in the cloud resources because you spin stuff up so quick and then you decommission stuff so quick. But that's why you also need a solution that's monitoring yeah, you, your configurations. You get a uh, Wiz as a cloud service. It's a CSPM or some whatever Wiz stands for. But you get a service like Wiz and then you do have an actual SOC IR team so they are noticing, hey, this bucket is public. It shouldn't be public. They're noticing yep, that, yep. hey, a root user did this or a successful API call. So they are seeing all this stuff in real time. And then that's when they respond to it to make sure, hey, y'all testing, you delete this, what this is. That's how they need to rotate it. your credentials, all these things. So that's why everything's a lot of times does start with that first line of defense, as well as making sure you have adequate rules and that they make sense for people and you're staying updated on what people are doing uh, to get access to people's environments. And something that we talked about earlier that I forgot to mention is tech bro type stuff. There is a difference between the theory of you studying cybersecurity versus actually being a practitioner. For example, a guy in one of my TikTok comments was critiquing he wasn't really critiquing one of my guests but they were explaining like how they got their first job and like they didn't know like everything but they just started listening out like what happens like they're on the internet and they start listening to stuff from the osi model and they tried to nitpick their answer and granted at the time they said it they had really just found out about cyber but that's not the point the person was trying to be real smart say like, well what if you find a threat at the transport layer or how they supposed to identify a threat at the transport layer and i was like my what boy, is this an interview I want to say now, I said, my boy, they got tools to identify threats at the transport layer. Nobody is in cyberspace <laughs> looking at yeah. the, it's on the transport layer. Nobody is doing that. The, the tools are doing that. Most of the time, it's going to come into you more reactive in terms of to check it out. And then if something starts happening over and over again, that's a trend. That's when you start figuring out, okay, is this a fly by scan or what are we seeing in our environment? So you got third, like, it's like you got Akamai, you got Cloudflare, you got Zscaler, like all these different companies, they got these different services to protect uh all your a lot of your internet facing apps from all these different threats so i just want to say like y'all stop trying to be so smart in the comments man and just pay attention to your own grind or whatever like you know if you were like you say you were you don't ha you wouldn't have to prove it and you'd have a job or you'd be running your own company a lot of y'all a lot so i just want to say that i want to double back on that though what you just said about theory versus like that working knowledge and that's why it's important to not just read but to also do and start to, you know, use these tools and understand how to use them versus you just reading the documentation about how the tool works, what features it has, what's the capabilities, but can you actually use the tool in a live environment? I think that also piggybacking off what you said, that'll help you get, get a lot further than just, oh yeah, I know what that is. I know what it does. All right. Well, what will you do if this didn't, if this circumstance happened, mm -hmm. what, what, how are you going to respond using the tool? And you would know because you would have had your hands on that tool before.